Welcome, everybody. Um, Sorry, like... pause. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to start the session just uh, just by giving you a few housekeeping rules. Um, so this session is being recorded um, and stream, stream live, um, but it'll also be on the website uh, later uh, if you want to if you want to share the link. Um, the session is also being simultaneously um, interpreted into Cantonese. Um, so if you'd like to to listen in Cantonese, please switch to the appropriate channel now. We do actively encourage comments and questions from the audience, and you can submit these through the chat function. And we're hoping that we'll have time to answer some of these um, later on in, in the session. So I'd start, like to start the session by introducing our chair, Ginny Wu, who's from Heart in Hong Kong. Over to you, Ginny. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Skinder, Chantal, Yang Yang, and Helen's sharing earlier. Now, for this panel, we, uh, we have Fiona and Maddie, and also um, Bas, uh, Bas, uh, Bas from International Photo Festival. Um, and unfortunately, um, she's uh, um, feeling ill, so she can't join us in this panel. So for this panel, we have Maddie and Fiona. And for today's um, panel, uh, first, maybe I will introduce the two panelists. Uh, Fiona Venables is the director of Milton Keynes Art Center, an organization specializing in developing co-created projects with artists and communities in the city, which responds to place. Fiona joined the organization in November 2019 with over 25 years experience as a curator of contemporary art. She managed the exhibition program at Warwick Art Center from 2012 to 2019 and at Tully House Museum and an art gallery from 2001 to 2012. Other organizations she has worked at include Manchester Art Gallery, Huddersfield Art Gallery and Mid Penny Arts in East Lancashire. And for Maddie, Maddie Nicholson is an artist and artistic director of Art Gene in Barrow in Furness, Cumbria, with Stuart Bastic. And as artists, co founder directors, they lead the company as an independent international research facility and agency engaging associate artists and architects in collaborative design led regeneration. Art Gene's research remit extends across a program of projects, residencies, exhibitions, and symposiums focusing on the role and engagement of artists and architects in the regeneration of the social, natural, and built environment. Across some of the most economically and culturally deprived worlds in Europe. As an artist, Maddie produced challenging work for varied and diverse situations nationwide video, cast iron, and stitch works to huge paintings and inflated and plastic sculptures. Uh, Base, although she can't join us, but I would like to introduce her too. Base Chan, curatorial assistant to a Hong Kong International Photo Festival in Hong Kong. Base is curatorial assistant at Hong Kong International Photo Festival, Hong Kong, and the festival was launched in 2010. In each edition, the festival focuses on a different theme, introducing noteworthy photographers, trends, and movements, and discussing manifold issues and perspectives. Through a wide range of public programs, the festival bridges Hong Kong and international visual practitioners, creating conversations between people and place, past and present, and oneself and the world. So in this panel, we will address the challenges and barriers for art programming, for placemaking and community building in the UK and in Hong Kong. In the process of preparing this panel, Fiona, Maddie and Bess all shared their experiences and insights on how they position themselves as key stakeholders supporting respective communities 
in achieving different common goals. Some we found quite universal, especially in the face of this time of pandemic, but some informed us, each other, to, the, to be realistic in societal and cultural sustainable developments. We will start this panel with brief presentations given by each of the panelists, followed by a few keynote questions addressing each and all of them. And we welcome any one of you to raise questions to heat up the dialogue anytime. So we will first start with Fiona's presentation. Okay, I will square, share the screen now. So over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Jeannie. And hello, everybody. Um, as Jeannie said, I am Fiona Venables and I'm director of Milton Keynes Art Centre, um, some of the image, images of which you see before you here. Um, I'm relatively new into post, um, so my presentation will be somewhat different to Maddie's. Um, and really, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Art Centre, about my background and leading up to a starting point in terms of where we are going at this point and um, how we've responded to the current situation of the pandemic. So as a little bit of context, um, Milton Keynes is one of um, what is known as the new towns. Um, it turned 15 in two, uh, 2017. Um, so it's at its middle, it's reaching its midlife crisis or has, has been going through it. It was the biggest and most ambitious of the third wave of new towns in the UK um, uh, and that, that was um, built following the 1946 New Towns Act. It also, um, the, it also coincides in many ways with the origins of placemaking as a concept, since placemaking really started to talk, be, being talked about in the 1960s um, and was adopted by urban planners in the 1970s. <laughs> Um, I find the, the context quite interesting in terms of this discussion and of the origins of Milton Keynes Arts Centre as an organisation. So Milton Keynes Arts Centre was established in 1974, one of the first generations of art centres developed in the city. And it was developed really at the height of the um, uh, British community arts movement, which was a, a short-lived um, uh, movement, if it can be called that, and many did at the time, which is really rooted in the idea of the right of working people to create their own art, uh, and the art that was rooted in their, uh, their experiences and their values. Um, and really it was about cultural democracy, about challenging the art establishment um, in their function or in their um, claim to be able to judge what was artistically worthwhile. Um, it was fairly, fairly short-lived, as I say, as we know, um, in the 1980s, it fell out of um, uh, its left-wing tendencies of those who followed it, um, questions over the, the quality of much of the output of community art. Um, and then in the 1990s in the UK, the establishment of the National Lottery and huge amount of funding that went into organisations much of which was really focused upon developing cultural beacons and many of them in ex-industrial cities, many of which were in the north as well, um, in creating in, and really refocusing art as a catalyst for urban regeneration. So I am a Geordie by background, I come from Newcastle, um, so the Baltic, the Sage are two organisations that were created sort of uh, post my living there. Um, but whereas in the in the idea of placemaking, um, if you uh, read the Danish arch architect Yang, Yang Gil, he puts it that placemaking is about first life, then spaces, then buildings, and the other way around never works, which um, really goes is counter to this idea of the uh, beacon of culture, this idea of creating a building which generates um, a tourism industry and services industry around it, which will, will then sort of create new work for that population. Um, it has its value, of course, and we know many instances, such as in Newcastle, where it's worked very effectively. 
But at the same time, many of the people who lived in the areas in which those buildings were built um, felt alienated from a, a program that was increasingly and in, had to be geared towards cultural tourism. And in many instances, as we know, the downside of um, cultural um, uh, catalyst for regeneration is that many of the people who lived in those areas were pr basically priced out um, of the immediate sort of uh, locale of those new beacons. So I, um, I find it really interesting that I came to the organization in November of last year. And this is an organization, as I say, which it was at the root, um, a community arts organization of the 1970s. It fell out of fashion somewhat in the 1990s. Um, it's had got, uh, borne the tide of fashion and politics um, and yet has survived. And here we are embarking on a new, new wave of culture or and reinterpretation or, or review of what culture means to cities and to the communities living in those cities. For me, it was a really interesting um, site in that we have, can we just go back to the original first slides, Jeannie, sorry. This, we are situated in Milton Keynes, this modern city, um, yet Milton Keynes Art Centre actually is sited in 18th century Parkland. Originally, the organisation was situated in Great Linford Manor Park, in Manor, Manor House rather, um, but um, has fallen somewhat down on its, uh, on its uppers and has moved into what were effectively the outbuildings. So what you see on um, top left is a thatched barn, 18th century thatched barn. Um, that is actually disguised from view of the manor house by two pavilions, which you see in the top right image, um, two matching pavilions, north and south, um, which if you look between them, though you can't see it here, looks towards the manor house. So these pavilions shielded um, the manor house from having to look at uh, the barn and also these pavilions which we are seeing the back end of them effectively in this picture. The front end look rather grand um, houses, they are designed to look at the manor house um, but actually also are masquerading in that they, these were stables effectively, they were houses to farm animals then to, if you look to the left within the same image of the pavilion is a schoolhouse, an almshouses, and almshouses were houses for the poor, which is where probably the um, women um, who, who's, who worked for, or who had husbands worked for the manor house were housed. So everything faces outward from this courtyard in which we're situated. Everything is made to look um, to sh demonstrate the benefaction of the Lord of the Manor as well as, and to uh, disguise from his view um, the fundamentals, the, the makings of the farm, the, the poor who lived there. So it's an odd place which is both about demonstrating and showing that the philanthropic giving of the, um, the Lord of the Manor, but also um, hiding from view, his view the worst signs of poverty um, that were there. Um, one of the newer buildings which is in the top left, um, bottom left I beg your pardon, is Radcliffe which was built in the 1980s. Now unlike the other uh, buildings around there, this was purpose-made. Um, so in the bottom right you see a, a silversmithing studio which um, is in there. There's also ceramic studio, uh, a a work, woodworking space and a wider, more generic art space. So it is a, it is a um, constellation of buildings with very loaded political, social, sociological origins, but also with uh, buildings which have, um, house this idea of making. And I felt was really um, an interesting context in which to embrace this new wave of working with people. Now, prior to working at, uh, prior to joining Milton Keynes Arts uh, Centre, um, I had fairly shortly beforehand worked on a developing an exhibition which was co-curated. We did an open call out for people to come forward 
we did um, tell them the, what the um, project was, which was to respond to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, but we invited them to come forward and curate that. So it was a project um, that went on for two years. Um, as we, we all know, exhibitions take a long time to actually develop. From that very first meeting um, in which we invited people to come along, 12 people did. Two years later, all of those, every single one of those 12 people remained. Um, it was a really interesting project in that they, between them, they were originally came in as researchers, but became very effectively curators. They selected the, ex um, the works for exhibition. They wrote the introductory panels and texts. They uh, designed the uh, events program that supported the exhibition. It, um, there were inevitably tensions within the organization of that. Um, I had, I was trepidatious in terms of what the selection might be. It's very difficult to hand over controls of curation, but um, there were, I found them ultimately uh, in many ways to be uh, institutionalized in some ways, which is not a good thing but they were very robust and uh, very uh, rigorous uh, curators that if there was a dispute, it was talked about. So actually it was a very sort of effective way of selecting works. Um, there were disputes over whether a, the fetishistic value of a paint splatter poetry book that belonged to um, Francis Bacon or, or an actual, uh, slightly amusingly, they didn't want to turn a work which had already had the loan agreed. Um, but despite the esoteric subject matter and Wasteland is obviously not a very easy poem, um, it was one of the most popular exhibitions I'd worked on that it actually generated an audience, the equivalent of our previous annual audience numbers um, in that they responded very specifically to the context, to Coventry. Um, they had a organised a performed reading of Eliot's poem in Coventry Cathedral. They took ownership over the events programme, they organised exhibitions outside of it, they organised um, open mic events. They very much, it was their show. I remember at one point them having an argument with the overarching curator who was also working on an exhibition in Margate um, about whether they had to have what he wanted in it, to which I said, no, you could do, you, we can say no to him. And so they very much, it was their show. And I, I found that a really valuable experience and something that I brought and was fairly fresh when I joined Milk Keynes Arts Centre. Um, so as I, I joined in uh, November, um, and then I was there for four months before lockdown. Um, and I was, had also fairly recently been reading Nina Simon and her ideas around the participatory museum and about museums and arts organizations being town, town squares of conversation. And the first thing I did as many organizations did was how do we respond to lockdown? How do we continue to work if we can't actually get onto our site? So we are at the beginning of a three year journey at the moment. Um, we've done a lot of work in putting our activities online, but we are not about presenting stuff there. Really it's exploring the idea of the digital as a way to talk to people, um, to find out what it is they want us to do, to find out what it is that interests them and or is relevant to their lives. And to try to use our website and digital channels, not as communication devices or ways of presenting work that's already been made or of marketing events that are coming up, but actually as an extension of the site itself, something that can invite people to be part of a conversation, to meet artists, to have opportunities to make things, um, but also just to talk to one another. And it's, I don't know whether we'll be successful, it's, it's a journey. Um, but this is, Part of what I think sort of we have an opportunity to do is we have making at the very core of our organization with this factory effectively in this building with its resources. Now we have to find ways to overcome the barriers of this site itself as in all organizations that is seen to be very historical and slightly pre pretty and somewhat outside of the lived experience of Milton Keynes as is known more generally but which I, I think sort of brings to people, um, comes back to an idea of a greener, 
more um, collaborative, um, more uh, conversational-based way of presenting work. And that's me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. So, um, next uh, I will be sharing uh, on behalf of BASE. Um, and um, so in the email that she shared with us when we prepare for this um, panel, she raised some very key questions um, to, to, to us. So, um, quote, uh, while the pandemic has posed specific problems, it also highlighted many ongoing issues and inequalities that have not necessarily been addressed by facilitators and artists in their quest to bring art to the community. Other than COVID-19, the political unrest in Hong Kong also raises questions of identity. Divided views also adding another layer to an ongoing question, who is the art for? And then, which community are we talking about? Art community or artist community or business community or local community? English or Chinese speaking community? The area of Sam Shui Po in Hong Kong is a great example of the clash between the art world. It affiliates the, and the, lo it affiliates and the local residents majority low income and Chinese and migrant workers, temporary tenants of subdivided flats, art being a catalyst for gentrification. In place making and community building for Base and Hong Kong International Photo Festival, they are interested in hearing about the challenges that they have come across and problems that they might have created along the way. Hopefully looking for, hope, hopefully through looking at the different environments in this discussion, we can also explore how different groups of society, especially communities that we ins insert ourselves to, can make part in the conversation and be involved in the shaping process. So uh, let me quickly run through um, her presentations too. Sorry about that. Sorry about this. Um, it's hard to locate her presentation, I'm sorry. So uh, maybe we can move directly to Maddie's sharing. Okay. Maddie, thank you. Are you wanting me to share or are you gonna share it? I will share it, I will share it, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you there, Jeannie. Um, I think in very interesting stuff that Bess was saying, and maybe we'll address some of that as, as we talk, but um, I'll quickly go through my slides. So, hi, I'm Maddie Nicholson. Um, I'm uh, both an artist and uh, a director of a, of a company called Art Gene. It's in the north of the UK, um, right on the edge uh, near the sea, um, called Art Gene. And I've just put this title up here with um, our whole environment could be a work of art in theory at least, yet with nature, art, industry and people, as we all know, the true value lies beyond the aesthetic. And that's a, a phrase from Stuart Bastic, who's, who's the co-director of Art Gene. Go on to the next slide, please. So what we do is, um, so it's very much um, uh, in, in the nature of uh, engaged practice, but we work, our research remit is around so the social, natural and built environment. We're around re revisioning that environment in any way that we can. And it's key that social is first in that collection of, of phrases there. Working with people, working with place and working with a physical place as well. So very much about place making and usually outdoors. Next slide. 
So the social uh, for us is about mobilizing and empowering people and working with communities to make change very much about giving a voice to local people. And the, a project that um, we've been working on now for the past four years um, has been a project which, which we've called Extreme Views for, about linking our landscapes and our communities. So Barron Furness is a, a town of vast, dense, terraced houses, which are very small houses with no gardens. Yet there's an amazing coastline um, not far away, but many people don't get out to that coastline because of a lot of health issues that they have. So it's a very, very poor area. Um, and as part of the project, we did a whole series of events over a number of years. And these two images are of a series of walks we did around different beautiful areas with what we would call extreme views, very strong and direct views or the views that people would have of those places. And we asked them to, to go on a walk with us. We had amazing food in, um, in front of the landscape and uh, we had after dinner speakers in the um, artwork at the end that says caution, slippery when wet, which is a sign that cleaners use in, in the UK to put down on wet floor. Um, we've done a very big version of it and, and we've used that as a, um, a stage for after dinner speakers. And we got people to speak about their extreme views, whatever they thought about place as a way of garnering opinion about an area. The projects developed over a number of years and it's very much been about listening to people and taking their ideas forward. And we've done a series of um, think tanks with working with local people, with different communities of interest and with local councillors and council officers. And from those think tanks um, has developed the programme of work that we're currently about to begin um, called Low Carbon Barrow, which looks at all issues to do with climate change and brings in grants for local people. Um, Big, a big amount of funding that we've managed to raise over um, over the last four years. So we're, we're looking at sort of two million pounds worth of funding that us as an arts company have brought into um, the, the whole political area. We don't receive that money. It goes out to grants to local people and businesses to help support um, sort of climate initiatives to help the, their houses or businesses. So that's just to give you a bit of an idea about how we work. Very much long time projects. Next slide. Uh, so we, what we aim to do is actively listen. That's that's a sort of a, a strange thing to say, but I, I use it as a, an active thing. Listening, I think, is a big part of how you can engage with people. We show we show care and share things. We're generous with our time, skills, resources, and our friendships. And this is one of the projects that has been ongoing for four years as well. This is a um, allotment soup, which is a community growing space that develops every year into a different ramification. And this is a very wet beginning to that. That's one of the first years with kids enjoying the mud. So I'll just put that in for fun. Next image. Um, the natural. So we remember with the social about people, first of all, the natural. So it's all that amazing landscape we've got out there. And one of the things that we understand is that places are never one thing. It's never just the natural or just you know, a building or the history. It's all of those things that we bring together. And most artists look at the big picture anyway, look at all of those different things. And in part, in part, what we're aiming to do with thinking about the places and never one thing is we're looking at bringing all of those aspects together. And this was a, um, a an artwork which we produced over a period of time um, on what was a First World War former gun range on a nature reserve. Um, and we called this One for Sorrow and it was around um, it was a non-civic war memorial in two parts. It had this part and a, a whole series of, um, a gate with a whole series of birds on it. Um, next image. And then as part of that process, we, we worked with local people. The, the artwork developed from working with local people, but we worked with local people um, and communities of interest. So people who were interested in history or interested in, in um, nature. And we developed mobile phone apps for the area. So they took you on a, a digital walk around the area. So you could see these you know, on your mobile phone, but you could also use it whilst uh, walking. And these are a couple of ladies who are metal detectorists of the area. And it used the voice of local people. So it was people who were narrating it and they were telling their story and their story of history and of the natural environment and of that place that meant a lot to them. Next slide. And then the built, which is the third thing in what we look at. So the built is anything from real structures to structures that we create ourselves. Uh, and these are um, uh, two of three um, off-grid touring eco pods, 
which are um, for a place called Roker in, in uh, the northeast in Sunderland. And a, one of them is a performance space and the other one is sort of an education space and a third is a, a kiosk cafe. Um, and this is for us very much about embracing new technologies and learning from old ones. These structures are made of steam bent oak, which is an old boat building technique. And they developed, ultimately they developed from conversations with all those communities of interest around that coast, from boat builders to, to local people and, and developed through their wants and needs. And also the, the council as a community of interest, what, what they were after, because they, they run and manage them. So steam bent oak, they have solar panels on them and a small wind turbine on the top. And they all of that feeds a battery pack that's in the, the, the bottom third of the structures. So next image. Um, and that's for us, a key thing is about tackling the imagination deficit. And often that's what, what arrives when you work um, uh, with different communities, that they want the smallest thing because that seems possible to them and seems the easiest. And what we're about is, is trying to push those ideas forward and give people confidence to have a voice and to be supported through that process. So that could be within a council as well as within a community. So we're tackling the imagination deficit and the risk averse culture. And this is a, one of those pods down on the beach in, in behind the beach cleaning tractor. And it seems scary to do that, but it's entirely possible. So we're often working with teams of people who can help and support us, engineers, et cetera, who have their, their skills and technologies. Next image. And then understanding the power of humor in communicating complex and serious and concerns and ideas. For me, humour is really important. It's a big key way to, to engage with everybody. People feel, can often feel quite alienated by art, think they don't understand it, think it's not for them. But actually it's out there. It's just a commentary on, on life really. And it's just a different way of looking at things. And often I'm, I, I'm working with moments of humour or, or a joyness that I would say, a bit of joy, because it makes people smile. And that's often the first way that you can have a conversation. And this is an inflated house that um, from one of the very small dense terraces that's in Barrow and Furness. And it's a project I did working with Fiona it, when she was formerly the director of Tully House Museum and Art Gallery. And this is a, a, a one single house out of a big long line of them. Um, that's five and a half metres tall and 11 metres long. And I took it on a tour around Cumbria to various beauty spots and engaged people with what they thought about housing. And it was a, just a delight to do. Really. It was a lovely thing to do and a great way to begin a conversation with a mass of people that all have houses and all um, talk to each other about similar sort of things. Uh, so next slide. And so the last one really is, um, uh, this is a bird hide on Walney Island. Um, so it's a um, quite precarious looking structure um, and the ability to make something look like it can topple is quite a nice thing to do. And it's built on top of a, um, a Second World War gun emplacement, uh, which because this was a former um, uh, Second World War um, training camp for the troops here. Anyway, create a culture of invention and imagination which positively embraces risk and an uh, as an opportunity for change. So I think we all have that within us, that sort of um, ability to invent and, and imagine young people, people within communities, whoever. And I think part of the ro role of artists in placemaking is to give that a voice, to listen, to support and to take people on a journey with you, to produce something that feels much more than they could ever have imagined. And that's why I delight in, in um, working with communities because I can see change um, through the process of, of, of working with people. And that feels good to me. That feels like I've made a difference. Okay, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Okay. So um, both Fiona and Maddie um, talked about uh, engaging people through brain uh, experiences to them and also empowering them uh, through a journey. So at this very challenging time that we can't uh, engage people through site specific projects, how do you face uh, the time now to engage and communicate and, and connect people? Um, it is a challenge, especially for, uh, I must admit for me, being new into post and having, um, I'm not from Milton Keynes, um, 
I'm sorry, at four months sort of going into lockdown and basically being sent home. <laughs> it's not ideal in terms of meeting new people. We had, um, I had established a few um, new links and I worked with obviously a really um, valuable and um, knowledgeable team of people who have established sort of contacts with some groups. We, the immediate thing upon lockdown was to try and maintain communication, as I say. So finding ways to one sort of um, acknowledge that many people who did come to the art centre had quite personal connections with the artists who led the courses there. So finding ways to put, make the artists more accessible on there rather than simply advertising courses to find ways for them to actually do uh, live streamed or recorded workshops for them to talk to people, for them to uh, interact with them in different ways. As So this is an ongoing and learning uh, curve for us. We also, um, one of our projects um, that was planned was with um, an artist duo, uh, Elmira and Romana Zadisa. They decided rather than to do the project, they planned to try and connect with people during lockdown and Particularly, they were interested in communities within Milton Keynes who were struggling to interconnect. Um, it is, it has a very specific issues attached to Milton Keynes as to how you navigate it um, and how you connect with new people. So they, they worked with the LGBTQ community in Milton Keynes. They also worked with the African Diaspora Foundation to co-curate series of events um, and all, and to collect stories and sort of to have that sort of interface with people. Um, so we're trying to do it on a small scale whilst also completely changing the way we work. So there are issues. I, I, I'm struggling in terms of um, how we provide, how we develop projects sort of in the future with very limited means to um, engage with artists directly. And at this point, I will bring Maddie, since I, we, were, we ought to hold our hands up in that Maddie and I, not only did we work together at Tully House, we were also planning to work together in Milton Keynes. So Maddie, we are hoping to work with next year. And she had a number of, she had a research trip planned fairly recently, but that was canceled because of, um, restrictions in Barrow in particular, and then subsequently in the national lockdown. So we're trying to explore as to whether we could have research groups providing eyes and ears for artists, um, how we might sort of enable them to actually sort of be um, on the ground and for them to determine what's of interest to the city, for instance, what's of interest to them, to, uh, rather than the artists going out and finding what's of interest to them and then asking people more. So we're just sort of exploring different options. Maddie, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. And we'll, we'll certainly develop and do that a bit further on. But with, with Art Jean, we've been, uh, we have a number of artists in residences ongoing. Um, things got cancelled as everything did. And we've now tried to put most things online and we, a big walk and event that we were doing outside we've brought online so we've done a whole series of armchair walks um which have been amazing because they've allowed many many more people than those that were local to engage with them so were, that that was done through film work and a big zoom event like this um with hundreds of people which was which was quite fabulous and we've got some more of those coming up um and then another artist that working with katie anderson has been developing a um barrow tarot which is a tarot card game as a way of engaging people that was to be done face to face. So we've worked with her to look at how to make that um, a thing that would happen online so you can use it as a game to play and start having a conversation about your town. And then also um, during lockdown, all the traffic stopped and all of advertising seemed to stop in this local area. And there were huge billboards around a, um, a road system. And I walked and took a photograph of this, which was just really weird to see no traffic, but very amazing, beautiful blue billboard signs with no nothing on them. And uh, we opened this up as a, a conversation for local people to come back and say, give us their eight words for Barrow, you know, on, to go onto these eight billboards. And um, we've mocked them up as various um, uh, pieces of art and created an installation on the outside of the building on a main highway. Um, so we've gone from one lockdown, then we've now a massive traffic and we have these people's voice on the outside of the building 
Um, and now we've gone back into lockdown and we're still getting crowds of people on their walk in a day coming to look at these. So it's their words outside the building. And it's quite interesting because it's a real commentary of a time. You know, it's in, very interesting to see a mass of positive um, phrases, some humorous and some really quite poignant um, so loads of different ways of trying to get people to engage. But yeah, you're thinking on the hoof all the time and that's all you can do, really. We're all in the same boat. But there's something interesting about that. Just looking at the chat there about the questions. Um, and so who's this place making for? You know, is it who's the arts for? I would say the arts for everybody. You know, you and I, um, us as arts companies, we're all part of the community. I'm part of the community here in Barrow. My voice is as important as anyone else's voice. The council, the, the local politicians are part of that community. They're all different communities, but we're all human. You know, we're all we all need a voice. So it's so for us, we work with different um, communities of interest around different projects. But then everybody pitches in when and when they when they want to. And I think making lines between different types of communities is sometimes quite hard because it can be alienating. Um, it can be good in one sense because it, it directs your focus to that community. But actually, you know, we all we all have similar issues happening to us. We maybe just think about them in different ways. So I think to try and be equal to everybody is, is really quite important. OK, so that was my. I want to open the floor for questions. Any panelists or participants want to ask some questions? Oh, yeah. Question for Maddie. If a place is lack of natural resources like Hong Kong, how can artists or art communities engage people in the natural aspect? Is the natural a big part of an identity making? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for me, natural stuff is important. I think it's kind of life-giving, you know, that aspect of green is really important. Now, whether that's um, whether you have your own garden as a rooftop garden or you go to where the water is, um, there are areas of natural. And I think they're places to to uh, be calm, to think differently, to to really engage with that sort of internal dialogue that goes on. And people do that in many different ways. And you find it in different, different ways in different places. And maybe that's an interesting thing for artists in Hong Kong to think about what is natural and where they go to get that moment. And it might be somebody has a beautiful little window box garden, or it might be you know down to the, um, to the waterfront there. And that's quite amazing. I remember Hong Kong many years ago when I went there and it's, it's a, an amazing world with the water there. So um, I think it's part of, um, it's part of who we are engaging with the environment, that natural environment. Um, it, and it might come from other ways. It might come from a physical sense, you know, engaging with something physically, about running or uh, looking at the environment that you that you have anyway around, um, around Hong Kong. But I think it's a key part of, I suppose in a way, why we work with social, natural and built is, what we're saying is we, we're working with people first and we're working with place. And here, place is the environment, the physical environment, whether that's buildings or its countryside uh, and the countryside is is quite small but it's quite important to us here yeah. also of course cities have the greater biodiversity than the rural areas now so yeah yeah i mean we're all animals uh, human or non-human um mm. and there is much more to be found in your in your garden or your window box possibly in your house um, than actually outside in many, uh, in more rural areas in many ways. Yeah. There is a huge problem in the UK in terms of rural areas and um, industrialised farming in terms of the impact upon biodiversity. And I think often um, they, certainly artists respond quite incredibly well to industrial and um, urban areas. You know, there's a lot more stuff to look at. And actually you can look micro quite often. And when we're developing a project here where um, we have these very dense terraced houses with backyards and a back street where all the bins go. And you know, it's kind of a really horrible area. But actually, once you start looking close, there is an amazing abundance of stuff going on there. And it's quite an amazing place. And it's only often those underlooked at spaces or those unloved spaces are spaces that actually can have something quite amazing going on or could be quite amazing. 
So it isn't just about beauty and beauty is the very least of it here in Barrow. And if anybody from the UK knows Barrow, it's not considered to be a beautiful place. So we look at other things. And as an audience in Hong Kong, a community member in Hong Kong, um, actually many artists are, are doing quite hard um, on, on addressing this problem. And um, the Yang Yang and also Dang Bok Hin in um, making of 1983, uh, located in a rural area is an amazing project that uh, to engage people um, to rethink and also to engage in places that are undermined or forgotten. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think those things are really fascinating to do, you know, often, often, uh, well, certainly traditionally here in, in the arts, um, uh, you know, beautiful areas were where uh, painters, you know, came and did and looked. I think most artists now enjoy that mix of urban industrial and uh, that odd ju juxtaposition that you get of beauty and industry together can make you look very differently at both things. And I think often that's what an art um, background or an artist can do is to make you think differently about the place you're in and then consider that place and value that place more or perhaps change that place a little to make it more valuable really to you and to, to others. So, yeah. So, oh, another question. Uh, leading on from Maddie's presentation, as arts professional, we feel like the art is ours. The various local communities feel like the place is theirs. How can giving and sharing between these two ownership paradigms help genuinely embed both into a place? I missed that last bit. What was the last bit that you said? How can giving and sharing between these two ownership paradigms help genuinely embed both into a place? Think addressing professionals and local communities member, I think it's the alienation or the hierarchy between the two. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think that can often be per perceived as a thing if people don't feel like they're part of something. And I think always what we try to do if we, if we're working with people is that they're, they're on us, on a journey with us, you know, and everybody's learning, you know, I don't feel I am an expert in anything, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of a dabbler in many things as lots of artists are. And I think that local people, people in a particular area, perhaps are the experts of that area. They understand it better than anyone. They have the most to give. So that's when that listening process is, is key. You know, I think to be very equal with people is, is really key and important. And um, to make sure that in if there's a mixed group, for instance, we've done um, uh, uh, think tanks here in Barrow, and we had um, international artists and curators and um, academics, people from the council, people from the local government, the MP. We also had local people as part of that process, and everybody was on an equal footing. Everybody was equal. And in fact, the local people were the were the, really the people that were the experts in that process. So we went on many journeys around the area, and they were the people that could talk with, with real integrity about a place and a real deep understanding. And it, and it was really heartening to see how um, those barriers can be broken down if there's a mutual respect. And I think that's always what you have to engage, a, um, what you have to work on an engaged process with is to realize that um, no one knows better than the person that's next to you. And you can always learn from them and they can learn from you. And it's an equal sharing process. And eventually you will get to something that's quite fascinating at the end of it. That's, that is um, a mix of everyone's views. And it's a very supportive, um, kind process that gets you to that end point. And sometimes I think it's about setting that up at the beginning by saying, we're going to listen to everyone, everybody's equal. You know, it's almost setting out the rules of engagement. Um, here in Barrow, we've, we've got a, it's a fabulous place, big industrial place. And I think in part because of the shipyard where it's a big noisy place, people often are quite shouty. They will shout at people to have a conversation. And I kind of quite like that. But often I start that in a, in a presentation, I say, you know, so us locally will start shouting, but it's only because we're passionate about something and we struggle to hear. So it's about just kind of trying to make allowances for everyone and valuing everyone's input equally. Yeah, I would I would endorse that, that everybody is a specialist and really acknowledging the specialism existing um, 
in a broad number of ways and, and bringing that to the table can be really interesting and it does take time. So in developing the Wasteland exhibition, as I said, there were moments, I mean, there was, I remember there was an, an artwork I really didn't like um, that was being um, put on the table that one of the, the members wanted. And for initially in the early stages, I, I wouldn't have spoken up and I would have let them come to their own uh, conclusions around it. Um, by the end of two years period, everybody was shouting up and everybody had felt confident enough in their views to have a, a constructive conversation. Ultimately it wasn't chosen and that wasn't me imposing that decision. They decided they didn't want it uh, um, themselves. But I, I was able to say, ultimately, I don't like it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and actually just be able to, and this is why I don't like it. Why do you like it? And what, tell me why it is you want, uh, what it brings to it. And all of, and they knew um, far more about the poem than I did. Um, they knew far more about, um, it, if some of them came with a specific interest in poetry, some with music, some just wanted to be part of something other. Um, and all of that brought something of value and all of that sort of enhanced and completely transformed what would have been probably a very austere, dry exhibition about very, very difficult poem, made it something that everybody connected to. Good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So it's about time. Okay. Oh, for Fiona, there's a final question for you. Um, you have both re, uh, really highlighted the importance of working with people. Do you think you can talk a little bit about the residency with Tang Kwok Hin and Newlin? Yeah. Um, it, there was a conversation within the peer-to-peer -peer network around really the subject around placemaking. Um, and I, I was really keen, coming back to, I guess, coming back to the history of this network, um, we, there was an intention of a group of uh, curators from the UK to go across to Hong Kong. Now that didn't happen initially because of demonstrations and latterly because of COVID. Um, and so we've been doing, well, ultimately we, we, at the moment we're doing this, um, we're, we're attempting to create links to forge networks to develop projects through virtual um, uh, talking to one another via Zoom effectively. Um, and I was really keen as to what I'm struggling with still to a certain extent is that I, I, I haven't met people outside of the arts professionals within Hong Kong um, and nor have the people in Hong Kong had an opportunity to sort of understand the context more broadly and meet people outside of the UK, well, other than through previous trips. So I wanted, I was interested in how we broaden it out and I, I, I remain so. So um, through conversations around that subject, um, Tan Kwok Hin was suggested as an artist who was developing work around a very specific walled city, uh, walled town within Hong Kong, and had, had, was very embedded. His family was very embedded in that place, and to explore this idea of these three specific contexts and, and Newlin, who also interested in the same subject, um, Milton Keynes, in a very, as you've seen, a very specific kind of context there, and Hong Kong, and but through talking to people there, so we we sort of. The intention, the hope is that we will engage with primary school children to explore ideas of each of those places. And each, uh, and there are challenges for those children in each of the area. We, we Milton Keynes is a very um, culturally diverse city, a rapidly expanding and changing city. Um, many of those young children, uh, certainly English is not their first language and actually being part of being connected to outside of Milton Keynes to global would be quite interesting. Newlin, um, my understanding is that some, some children there 
may not have ever left um, Cornwall and have had limited opportunity to travel the world. So again, it's kind of reaching out and exploring the, the local versus the global and how those interconnect and strengthen one another. And so we're really interested in just starting up those conversations, but it's the starting point and we hope it will be a short term project, but might lead into something other um, that might be through the artists It might be through connecting to the people in those schools It might be connecting to um, uh, the other groups that we engage along the way, but it's seeding something and then we just see where it goes. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you. So uh, we have to wrap up now. So a uh, concluding remark. Um, so all the panelists' passion and determination contributing to community engagement in face of all challenges in placemaking are the very essence to keep our creative ecosystem growth. We hope you all gain some perspective from this sharing and we all look forward to see you and engage um, in conversation with you in the upcoming three panels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can I, can I ask everybody, thank all the panellists and thank you, Jeannie, for sharing. And can I ask everybody to actually to sign up, if possible, to the first talk tomorrow, which is actually about climate change and the arts.